Thank you. Good morning. It's so good to see you. Ann Beto, as Aunt Nan, as I called her, has been part of my life as long as I can remember. I think of her often. My mother, her younger sister, was her only living sibling that I knew. Although quite different, they were very close, and she was frequently a guest in our home. It was not until the last four years, however, that I really knew Ann Beto. She did not talk about herself. She did not talk about her accomplishments. But she did sing the praises of First Methodist Church of Birmingham, where she was an, a steward, a CARA Club member, and a member of Mrs. Oates' Sunday School class. She lived her faith, a humble servant of God, and she served mankind. Although she did not talk about herself, Ann Beto kept meticulous records which documented her life and her accomplishments. A journal of her life during World War I, medals, papers, photograph albums of her life during World War I with accompanying identifications of each photograph, other memorabilia, scientific papers she had written, albums with newspaper articles about her career, etc. Everything came to me when my mother died. The collection remained in a steel cabinet in my basement 15 plus years. I had always intended to look at it carefully, but I kept putting it off. And when I finally did, this is one of the regrets of my life because I could have asked her so much and I'm really sorry I was so late. I found that to the world, Ann Beto was a hidden secret until 2014 when I did begin to read and inspect the Beto collection. I have since given the collection to the Alabama archives it has been a pleasure working with, along with the staff and knowing them, particularly Debbie Pendleton and Haley Aaron, the archivist to whom I left the collection. The archives had much of the collection photographed by a professional photographer. Those photographs have been digitized and made available to me. Several of those photographs are used today. I photographed a few. Some are photographs originated by the United States government. Original album photographs are Miss Beto's work depicting a photographic history of World War I on the Italian front. Photographs kept in a scrapbook are pictures, newspaper articles, and other things that she kept. On June the 14th, 1778, the Second Continental Army authorized the creation of the Continental Army, which became the United States Army. Major General Horatio Gates reported to Commander-in-Chief George Washington the men were in need of good female nurses. Washington agreed and asked Congress to appoint someone to supervise nurses. On April 28, 1898, when the Spanish-American War began, Surgeon General Brigadier General George M. Stemberg was authorized to appoint women nurses. He placed Dr. Anita Newcomb McGee in charge of the selecting the Army nurses the contract nurses from religious orders and with assistance of the American Red Cross. Dr. McGee later became acting assistant surgeon in charge of the nurse corps division of the Surgeon General when it was formed. Upon entering World War I, April 6, 1917, the United States authorized creation of the Army School of Nursing which became the U.S. Army Nurse Corps. 
Among nurses inducted was the American Red Cross Nursing Service Unit of 10 from Birmingham's St. Vincent's Hospital. Although each member of the unit was special, Ann Beto was, a 19, was 2016 inductee into the Alabama Women's Hall of Fame. The first recipient of the Alabama Women in History Award given by the Women's Committee of 100 for Birmingham and recipient of the 2015 Distinguished Service Award given by the Alabama Association of Nurse Anesthetists. Ann Beto distinguished herself on the World War I battlefield on the Italian front and thereafter as a highly regarded, certified, registered nurse anesthetist. The front page of the Alabama Women's Hall of Nomination, which I submitted in 2015, is pictured on the left. The nomination was seconded by the Alabama Association of Nurse Anesthetists and the American Association of Nurse Anesthetists. The picture on this picture was the relief from which the monument for the Alabama Women's Hall of Fame was formed. Her path to fame began at St. Vincent's Hospital, the School of Nursing. Ms. Beto is the third person from the left. This was her graduation class and her beloved St. Vincent's nurse's pin, which she wore. The Birmingham 10 served as surgical teams with Base Hospital 102 in Vincenza, Italy, under the leadership of Sister Chrysostom, the first registered nurse in the state of Alabama. The base hospital was founded by Dr. Joseph A. Dana from the New Orleans Loyola Medical School, and it was attached to the 332nd Regiment from Ohio, which was brigaded with the Italian armies. The Nursing Sisters of Charity were the only band of nursing sisters from America who went to World War I, and they went to Italy. They were originally a part of the American Red Cross Nursing Service. In 1957, the Red Cross honored Miss Beto with a 40-year service pin, a lifetime commitment. At the top, you will see her Red Cross Nursing Service identification card, which gives her name, it gives the school from which she graduated, and it was an ID card which she carried with her. This is her Red Cross Nursing armband, which was worn when she was in the hospital as a nurse. It was not part of the regulation uniform, and it was kept in the ditty bag which she had. In February 1918, at the Abbeville Alliance Conference, the Italian Prime Minister, Victorino E. Orlando, requested that American troops be put at the disposal of the Italian Army Headquarters. Under public pressure from the Italian-American population, feelings of a moral obligation, and honoring the request of an ally, President Wilson decided to send one regiment, the 332nd Infantry. The Birmingham 10 went to war as American Red Cross nurses, and they became members of the 1st United States Army Nurse Corps. The nurses left Birmingham for Atlanta with trepidation and excitement. From Atlanta, they proceeded to Camp Gordon, Georgia, where they were ordered to active service in the military. They were fitted for their custom-made uniforms, which they received before leaving camp. 
Vaccinations were given, records were carried with them, and Lieutenant Beto's orders show she was ordered to active duty May the 8th, 1918, with approval of the Secretary of War. She reported to Camp Gordon Base Hospital May 27th, 1918, as a lieutenant for the Army Nursing School for the 1st United States Army Nurse Corps. This was two months prior to the July 9th, 1918 Army Reorganization Act. Ms. Beto is pictured in her official uniform. This is her official card that she carried with her. The top, you see her color, pins, her insignia as a second lieutenant. And at the top, it's the overseas ribbon which she wore for service in Italy. Anyone who's been a soldier knows that you wear a dog tag, and this was her dog tag. Her name is on the front, and her number is on the back. The ditty bag carried with her held identification or medical record and a Red Cross armband. You will see her right there and her name is written across the bottom. Identification papers. And you'll note that Haley has put that in a case outside if you'd like to look at it more closely. Travel papers, and they are also in the case outside. And what every soldier needed, a songbook, and a mirror. At the time I gave the collection to the archives, these are the items that were in the bag. In addition to her military things, she had in there, this was her name tag at the 1935 convention of Altrusa, and it was at that time that the Altrusa International was formed, and she was a charter member of that. Over here she has pins from her nursing service her, in the field of anesthesia and other things that were connected with her religious service to her church. Following mobilization at Camp Jordan, the unit left for New York July the 3rd, where on July the 5th they reported for mobilization with Base Hospital 102 in Vincenza, Italy. Lieutenant Beto described their stay in New York as four happy weeks. The nurses were housed at La Marquis Hotel in beautiful rooms and they were served good food. The Birmingham 10 are pictured on the steps of St. Vincent's Hospital with Sister Chrysostom and Beto's in the plaid dress next to her, two staff members of the hospital, and these 10 young ladies are the Birmingham 10 who went to war. Prior to leaving Birmingham, the unit was given an American flag by the Sisters of the Charity to carry with them to war, and it hung in Italy at the base hospital. Lieutenant Beto recorded the following. I wonder if anyone shall ever forget the Tuesday morning on which we donned our uniforms. We were all so happy that morning when we went to St. Stephen's Church to have our beautiful Old Glory dedicated. The service was very beautiful, but the sermon was too touching for most of us. I was so afraid my tears would be shown in the picture taken afterward. Base Hospital certainly held up New York traffic that morning. Other than tears of laughter, I never saw her cry. The unit was entertained royally and, in her words, treated beautifully in New York. 
as they toured the city. Their New York reception was something that almost like you would expect for a victorious return. Her description of New York's stay concluded with a vivid remembrance of a reception for Alabamian General William C. Gorgas, the Surgeon General 1914 through 1918, who was involved with establishing the Army School of Nursing. General and Mrs. Gorgas made good impressions on the sisters and on the nurses. The nurses were anxious to leave New York and they traveled by ferry and by train and they finally arrived at the dock in Baltimore to see their ship, the Umbria. They spent 26 days on that trip going from Baltimore to Italy. At 5.15 p.m. August the 4th, 1918, the old Umbria left Baltimore for the battleships of Italy. The next morning, rescue of 13 survivors from the British tanker Jennings, which had been torpedoed by the Germans, necessitated a return to the States. Because the German submarine had come so close to the United States shore, on continuing, the portholes were covered at night. They continued travel without convoy support across the Atlantic. As officers, their accommodations were better than those of the troops that carried with them. Beto and three others were housed in a stateroom together. Others did not fare so well. Officer nurses ate in the guest dining room and were served by waiters. Each unit member was given a rubber life suit, constructed much like the diver's suits. The suit covered the entire body. Each foot contained 14 pounds of lead. According to instructions, one wearing a suit could stand in water without drowning. With amusement, Lieutenant Beto opined 28 pounds of lead would take her to the bottom. Since the Atlantic was deeper than her five, at five feet, four and a half inch height, she would suffocate in a tight rubber suit. No mention or provision for providing oxygen was recorded. Amid laughter, the nurses decided that they would drown before putting, donning the suits. But before their arrival in, little, in Italy, they were adept at putting them on. And surely, oxygen was provided. The Umbria docked at Gibraltar from August the 17th through August the 21st, her birthday. Arriving without convoy, protection. Upon departure, four gunboats and 20 other vessels traveled with it. The American troops were attached to the Italian Third Army. When after 23 days, the ship arrived at Genoa, there was no welcome from Italians. In sharp contrast, to an amazing show of gratitude from the Italian people when they departed Italy for home. To a band playing the Star Spangled Banners and shouts of gratitude and love from the Italian people for the service they had given to the Italian servicemen and to the Italian people themselves. Arrival in Genoa on their way to camp. The officers and the boys, as she called them, were housed in the tent camp. And the women were housed in Hotel Victoria for 10 days. This was the only word that was sent home 
with a safe arrival. One field hospital and one base hospital were attached to the medical troop department. Although American troops were sent, the government only sent the one regiment with the necessary hospital and auxiliary services. Base Hospital 102 was permanently stationed in Vincenza September the 6th, 1918. Soon after arrival, the official picture was taken. You see the soldiers in the front, the Sisters of Charity in the middle, and the nurses are behind. During the operation with the Italian Army conducted in October and November 1918, one of the bloodiest campaigns of the war, this base hospital sent surgical teams to the front lines serving as dressing stations and they assisted in evaluation of the wounded. The hospital limousine and next to it, the French Red Cross wagon pulled by horses. The French graveyard next to the hospital and Italian friends. The operate, one of the operating rooms, how would you like to be operated there, on there? Mastoid patients, patients of one of the nurses, an Italian nurse with two patients, a Belgian refugee, and this is the Italian interpreter who traveled with them. Officer Patton was from New Orleans, and this captain, they were both captains, this captain, and I hate to tell you, I do not know his name because I never was able to read Miss Beto's writing very well. Haley, I'm sure, will find somebody here who can read it and tell me she's sodding her head, yes. Pictures of bombing there. And I've included these because it's to remind you where these nurses actually fought on the battlefield. One of the bad battles of the war was at Asiago, and this is what it looked like after the battle. The beautiful cathedral was damaged severely. World War I initiated development of anesthesia, suffering more urgency for pain relief. On the battlefield, the urgency of alleviating the suffering of the wounded and dying of untreated horrible wounds. Miss Beto developed the technique by which pentothal sodium would be administered intravenously with oxygen. When the Crippled Children's Clinic and Hospital of Birmingham opened its doors for the new building, a 1951 article praising the hospital also praised Miss Beto. The new hospital is fortunate in having a person like Miss Beto for nurse anesthetist. Miss Beto, a graduate of prestigious Lakeside School of Anesthesia, Cleveland, Ohio, is a pioneer in the use of pentothal sodium as an intravenous anesthetic and in developing the technique now universally used in administration of the popular anesthetic. The article also included that she was a trustee of the American Association of Nurse Anesthetists at that time. In a post-World War paper presented, Ms. Beto described anesthesia as one of the oldest arts an art in which scientists, physicians, anesthetists, and manufacturers have continued to seek the ideal anesthetic agent, one that is primarily safe for the patient during the operation 
and affording the least post-anesthetic disturbance, which at the same time would afford sufficient relaxation for the surgical procedure. Although history of intravenous anesthesia was first unsatisfactorily attempted in 1792, it was not until the perfection of the technique administering pentothal sodium that the art was considered the latest development in anesthesia. Subsequent to closing the paper, Miss Beto opined, following my administration or supervision of administration of pentothal sodium administered simultaneously intravenously with oxygen in 5,000 consecutive cases. I am convinced when properly administered and only by a skilled anesthetist that this drug more nearly reaches the ideal than any agent that has been perfected. At the time of her 1974 death, the Birmingham News reported records of Abbott Laboratories show she was the first nurse anesthetist to administer pentothal to a large number of patients for major surgery begun during the Vittorio Veneto offensive along the Italian front. After the armistice was reached, the 332nd Regiment stayed in Italy as the Allied occupation force. Lieutenant Beto stayed until May 1919. For work as a member in the United States Army Nurse Corps, the United States awarded Ms. Beto the Victory Medal with an Army Service Clasp of Italy showing where she served. Ms. Beto's Victory Award is the only one in the Alabama archives with the Italian clasp. Here you see the medal, the box it came in, and the mailing box. For those of you who are collectors of anything, you know you have to keep the boxes to keep the value up. The back of the medal is inscribed with the words, The Great War for Civilization, as well as the names of the countries, France, Italy, Serbia, Japan, Montenegro, Russia, Greece. Great Britain, Belgium, Brazil, Portugal, Romania, China, and the United States stands alone on the shield in the center. She was awarded two medals by the Italians in addition to the cherished red patch received earlier with the Lion of St. Luke St. Mark, holding the 102 of the base hospital. Although forbidden to wear this patch by the United States Army, the regiment did. The 332nd was attached to the Italian Army, not the United States Army. The patches were hand-sewn by the Italians in appreciation for the care and aid given to the Italian troops and people. The patchet was worn proudly, defiantly on the uniform sleeve. Anne Beto went to war as a nurse anesthetist. She returned home a nurse and a nurse anesthetist, profession she promoted for the rest of her life serving terms as president of the Alabama Nurses Association and a member of the American Hospital Association and actively involved in forming the Alabama Association of Nurse Anesthetists, the Southeastern Association of Nurse Anesthetists, and a founding member and trustee of the American Association of Nurse Anesthetists. Her prolific writings appeared frequently in professional journals. 
Miss Beto joined the hospital staff of Norwood Hospital in the 1920s, specifically to work with Dr. Ben Carraway, a pioneer physician in the field of anesthesia. While serving at the hospital as a nurse anesthetist, she was the first woman appointed to the Norwood Hospital Board of Directors, and she was the first woman elected a female board member. Ever faithful to the Methodist Church, a Birmingham News article began with words, although still a young woman, it ended with the following passage. Possessed of a generous philosophy of life and endowed with qualities of leadership, she has been very active in the Red Cross committee work and local and state organization work. An ardent churchwoman, she has the unusual distinction of being a member of the Board of Stewards of the Methodist Church in Birmingham, which has the largest membership of any church of this denomination in the world. She was a steward. This is the 1920s. She was elected to that, and most of the people on that board on the, were physicians in town, which gives you some idea of the way they felt about her. God, country, and family were the center of a life devoted to service. A forward-thinking leader, graciously challenging and breaking barriers of advancement for women and for medicine, while living life to its fullest. In closing, I share a prayer she had heard given in the Garden of the Tomb in Jerusalem, a prayer she sent years later to her nephew, William Beto, a World War II bomber pilot killed following a bombing raid when his plane was rammed by a German plane. A prayer with the notation, she prayed he had kept it with him. A prayer appropriate for veterans, active military members, military families, and for those of us who are present today. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this precious moment. We thank Thee for these hallowed places. We thank Thee for these deathless words we have read together. May we this day of conflict reveal Thy love to all mankind. For all people are Thy people. This is Thy world, and they who dwell herein are thy children. We pray that we may follow thee in the way of righteousness and justice into life eternal. May Ann Beto no longer be a hidden secret. May Alabamians and Americans recognize Ann Beto for her major contribution to World War I as a nurse anesthetist and a soldier. May Alabamians and Americans recognize Ann Beto for her contributions to World War I and to anesthesia, and therefore as a religious and professional leader. May all of us who have had surgery or will in the future realize that each of us is a beneficiary of the work of Ann Beto, World War I nurse anesthetist. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gibbons. If you have a question, please raise your hand and either myself or Mary Beth will pass you the microphone. We're recording today's session for YouTube. All right. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Were there any Italian nurses attached to the company when they went over to Italy? Yes, the, I showed you one picture of them.
This is one of the Italian nurses. A question about her, on her service. Uh, notice that she was she went in as a second lieutenant. Was she ever uh, promoted while she served? She wasn't there that long. Okay, uh, thank you. She remained a second lieutenant. One of the interesting things, my son, who's a Marine, has just insisted that no women served on the front. She wasn't with an American troop. She was with the Italians, and they took them to the front. And her photographic albums show when they are crossing the front line, other pictures. They were actively involved in battle on the front. I just wanted to comment that the U.S. Army forces that are currently stationed in Vicenza, Italy, still wear the winged line patch. Good for them. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing, and it meant a lot to them, and obviously still does. Uh, do you know if there's any relation between the Patton in that photograph and George Patton? They look strikingly alike, but I know Patton was in France, not Italy. I doubt it. I don't know, but I doubt it. Did she ever go back to Italy after this? I don't know, but that doesn't mean she didn't. She traveled a lot. She was a, in demand as a public speaker, and she traveled all over. So that she probably did. Don't be shy. Uh, I know that your research has focused on Anne, but do you know anything about the other 10 nurses that went um, from St. Vincent's? I do not. And I tried to get some information from St. Vincent's Hospital, and I did not get anywhere with that. So I don't know. I do know that she was the one who came out with what it's her technique in medicine that made her different from the rest of them. And from reading things that she wrote, I believe she's the one who taught others there how to use the anesthesia. I do know that the surgeons all wanted her to operate with them. And that's recorded in her journal that she kept that Haley's dying to get and I will get to her when I finish the book. I'm writing a book about her and when I finish that it'll come to the archives but in the meantime I'm struggling over reading her writing. We can help with that. <laughs> Over here, Ma'am, you mentioned that uh, she was affiliated with the Cleveland School of uh, Anesthesiology. She, she was, was a graduate of the a graduate of that. Yes. Was that a school or a facility attended by male and females? And was that a, like for doctors and nurses or do you know? At that particular time you didn't find many physicians who gave anesthetics. It was a female occupation at that time. So at the time she was there, no, I don't think there would have been any men there. At that particular time, the men who went into medicine wanted to be doctors. And then afterwards, as the field developed, more and more men and women went into the field of anesthesia. And you'll find, I gave this talk at the Hoover Library last week for a Veterans Day program. And there was, there were several anesthesiologist who came to hear it and was speaking with them afterwards they were so complimentary of her and things they had heard about her and how unusual she was and that they learned that in school as they went to school later All right, we have a question over here. when was St. Vincent founded and was it the first hospital in Birmingham? 
It was the first hospital in the state, I believe. It was founded in 18... Oh, goodness. 1895, I believe. It had not been too long before the sister sit nurses here. Uh, originally, it was in Southside was as a small facility, and then it developed into the hospital. And for those of you who remember the original building, that's where she was. So, and that building has since been destroyed, and I'm so sorry. All right, if we have no further questions, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you, Ms. Gibbons, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you for being a good audience. Alabama Heritage Magazine has provided copies of the issue that features Ms. Gibbons' article. They're available on the table as you leave um, this auditorium today, so be sure to grab a copy.